Welcome back, Disruptor, to another episode of the Liberation Lab podcast, Insights and Interviews for the Disruptive Educator. As always, I'm your host, Bobby, and I am so excited that you tap back into another episode with us. Listen, some quick um, items before I get into today's uh, uh, today's episode. First, uh, if you've been following me, you know that Instagram has been a big part of uh, my platform and what I've done. If you've searched recently, you will not find me there. Uh, honestly, there was a lot uh, going into that decision. Um, I will say that when it comes to reach, when it comes to um, your content being um, searchable and and able to be of a, of a support, uh, Instagram just kind of limited, uh, you know, what I was seeking to do with, with Liberation Lab. So rather than try to continue, um, uh, I thought it was wise to go ahead and get rid of it. So if you are seeking to connect with me, go to the show notes, you will find me, uh, at on LinkedIn and on YouTube. If you have not already done so subscribe on YouTube, follow me on LinkedIn. There is an exciting live stream coming with Dr. LeGarrett King as we discuss how to celebrate black histories. That's coming up January 31st. Uh, the link is in the show notes of this episode. So without further ado, I want to dive into uh, today's topic, and that is what is the problem called equity? I want to set this thing up because for me, the issue hinges on the fact that we have been saying this word equity for what seems like forever. If you were to search up your school, a neighboring school, a school down the block, wherever, you will probably see the language of equity embedded within their website, their statements and things like that. So my question then is, if equity is something that we all seem to aspire to be, why is it taking so long to get there? Why does it seem like equity is this uh, invisible, hard to reach metaphorical place that schools will always say that they are striving to be, but no one seems to point to this is how we do that. So I have some things that I've been thinking about and brewing on. So uh, when we talk about equity, one of the things that really burns me up is the fact that we schools are more concerned with looking right than actually being right. Schools are more concerned with what it looks like on the surface. Schools are more concerned with the website being pristine and the walkthrough or the press release looking like it's all good. Then they are with actually doing the work that's embedded in the communities that we are entrusted to serve. So equity is difficult for multiple reasons. And the one thing that I think that we have to get a grip on is, is, is the fact that we struggle to define equity. For example, when we when we think about harm or marginalization, we tend to think about that on an interpersonal level. We equate it to being unkind. I told a story uh, throughout this podcast. I think it's um, my sixth grade year being told that I did not belong in the gifted and talented program. I was one of two. Um black students involved in the program. And as I was one of two black students involved in the program, uh, going through my mom, going through a divorce, I had, I was, I was angry. There was a lot of things going on. I did not perform well. It, it didn't go well for me. Well, by the end of the fourth marking period, the teacher writes in the report card that I don't belong. And those words haunted me for a long time. Was the teacher 
unkind. Absolutely. Did she take some level of empathy to get to know me, to figure out what was going on, to figure out how to better motivate me into how to get better production in terms of seeing my mastery of skills, if I could re actually do the work? No, she didn't do all those things. But when we talk about marginalization, we fail to see it from a systemic level. She was allowed to write that on my fourth marking period comment section because there was a system set up that says this is how you identify who belongs and who doesn't. She was allowed to say what she did and exclude me from the program, despite being the only black male in the program. Because the criteria, the systems, the policies and the practices were not set up for me to thrive. There wasn't an acknowledgement of the social emotional piece, child development. There was produce or be moved out. When we talk about a systemic level, we're talking about the policies, traditions, and customs that govern a school towards the inequitable outcomes. One of the things that I really, really struggle with is how we define equity and even more so how we define liberation. For those who are uh, tapped into my uh, platform and tapped in on YouTube, excuse me, you'll see a image come up that I think that we've seen a bunch of times. On the left, three kids standing on three boxes, the same size, looking over a fence at a baseball game. And it says equality. In the middle, those same three kids Tallest kid doesn't have a box. The medium sized kid has just enough to see over the fence and the shortest child has has two boxes so he can see over the fence. But the last one is called liberation. And it's very interesting that they call it that because now there's no boxes and there's no fence. By now, hopefully, you know, the image I'm referring to. Let me just say I hate this image. I hate this image for multiple reasons. First, when we talk about equity and liberation, we we're supposed to be talking about it from the standpoint of access. We're supposed to be talking about it from the standpoint of who gets to be included, who is represented. The position of the children with regard to the game that they are seemingly enjoying does not change. They are on the outside looking in. Part of the reason that we struggle with equity and liberation is because our dreams are not big enough. See, it's good enough for these children to remain on the outside, but what if they were actually members, participants of the game that they enjoyed? What if their access got them to a point where they were no longer bystanders in the thing that they enjoyed, but they could actually take part in it? Equity remains elusive because we do not define it well enough. There is this notion that of meritocracy, that we need to have everything being uniform in order for it to make sense. And that isn't true. There are educators at all levels who struggle with this concept. Giving each child a Chromebook when the pandemic started, that was equality. Everyone got the same thing. However, there were some children that did not have access to Wi-Fi that could support the learning that they would be doing. They now needed Wi-Fi access. They now needed a space to learn. They now needed to have their responsibilities at home uh, to be restructured in such a way where now school was competing with 
the responsibility they had to care for a little brother or a little sister. See, when you think about things in that light, equity is giving that child what they need to be successful. I want to be careful here because this is this is the part where it seems like we're kind of talking in our own silos. Equity is messy. Who's responsible for ensuring that 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 child has everything that they need? Is it the school? Is it the community? Is it the parents? Are there nonprofit organizations? You see, all of these things contribute to the messiness of liberation, of equity. And part of the reason that we won't engage with it is because there's no nice, neat, wrapped with a bow response. So getting back to this image, we need to put ourselves in a position where the access to the thing that the student is enjoying, the student wants to be a part of, that there, that access is there for them and they can tap into it in a real way. So the problem of educational equity is first, we struggle to define it, but also we fail to listen. We fail to listen. The reality is we don't, we don't listen well, like at all levels. It's real easy for us as educators to turn to leaders and say, you're not hearing me because because the power isn't in our favor. But what about how well we listen to our students? You see, at the classroom level, students aren't going to communicate that things aren't working well with them or for them with words like, I feel intellectually unsafe. They're not going to do that. It may be name calling. It may be work avoidance, off task behaviors. And other unwanted things. Cornelius Minor, author of We Got This, points out that equity can be embedded in our daily choices. He uses a series of reflective questions. And these reflective questions I'm, I want to pose to you. What are the specific systems in schools that might marginalize kids? What practices might empower some kids but harm others? What are the uncommunicated expectations in your class? Have you thought critically about what it means to be successful in your classroom? Have you defined success with and for your students? Have you defined it with and for your colleagues? Have you defined it for the families that you serve? Does everyone, is everyone able to come to the table with some semblance of what it is that that student needs to be successful in your classroom? Think about grading. Think about the fact that we will grade and then put in zeros for things that happen to be late, but say that grading should be about mastery. Well, if I'm grading based upon how quickly someone turns something in, then are not grading for privilege. Have I created the conditions so that every single person has access to do to do this thing on time? Or have I put it in or established the process of completing an activity, the process of completing an assignment? Have I put it in such a way where now that student who might need extra time, won't have time after school and therefore has to figure it out on their own at home, whatever have you, with access to whatever materials they have once they leave the building. Think about who and how you call on your students. Well, well I call on them, Bobby. I just I call on them and they answer the question. That's how it works. Maybe. Or, or maybe. 
there might be an equitable way to call each student, to engage each student in such a way that now they feel like the classroom is and answering that question is a part of the learning experience. Have I made it such that students feel safe to take the academic risk? Or do I just do I just say it and expect it? Here's a big one. Discipline. Who gets written up in your class? Who gets removed? Who are the students that are found leaving your classroom? I was working with the school about and, and trying to engage with them um, on restorative practices. And so we talk about having restorative mindsets. And without telling them, I put the data of their discipline referral process in front of them. And I told them that it was a different school. So they look at the data and I say, what, what advice would you give to the school? And everybody starts going in on how it seems like they're not being fair. How it seems like they're not really reflecting on their teaching practices because the number one um, infraction that students were engaged in is walking out of class without permission. If a student's walking out of class without permission, aren't they avoiding something or trying to get away from something? And if students are voting with their feet about their position in the classroom, and that's the number one thing that is happening, then what does that say about our teaching? What does it say about their place, students' place in our teaching? You see, when we think about discipline and we think about the process of ensuring that students have a safe space to learn and all of those things, we tend to think that us being in a judgment in the judgment seat means we're right. Maybe there's a better way to do things. Are we are we being self-reflective? Are we being self-aware? For school leaders, you must make this central to your school culture. Equity work isn't something additional that you do. It is how you choose to show up daily. Equity work isn't just something that you say at the beginning of the year and then you put it away, let it collect dust, and then you dust it off at the end. It's how we choose to engage with our staff members. Because if I have a teacher in my building, our building, let me use better language there. If I have a teacher in our, in our building who is not engaging in the process of self-reflection, is not growing, uh, seems to be resistant, that's reflective on me as a leader. Have I put them in a position to where these things can be accessed? Have I challenged them in such a way that says it's safe to make mistakes and grow? And the reality is you're not going to do this perfectly. Man, I fail at this all the time. The question is, are we getting up and trying again? Are we putting ourselves in a position where failure isn't the period at the end of the sentence, but it might be the comma in the middle? Equity work for leaders is how you choose to be willing to pivot. I heard an analogy once that really resonated with me. And it was talking about how if you've ever been stuck behind somebody who had their blinker on, their turn signal on as you're driving, and they had it on for like a mile, at some point as you're behind them, you're going to wonder when they are going to turn because they've indicated that the turn is coming. They've said that it's happening and yet it hasn't happened yet. You're expecting the turn before they make it. As leaders, that's what our pivot should be. If we are going to change something in our schools, in our process, in our district, where in our classrooms, we should do it in such a way where everyone is expecting and asking about the change before we make it. That we have brought everyone in on why this change needs to be made. Problem is we pivot without purpose. And then people lose sight of why we pivoted and don't buy into equity because it seems like this elusive dream that will never happen. But thirdly, we struggle with equity because we aren't committed enough in this moment. Chances are that there are two ways of looking at this, that in this moment, folks could be committed 
to returning to the golden age of education, returning to yesterday. And the folks who are committed to returning yes to yesterday are failing triumphantly, failing miserably. It doesn't take much for us to recognize that today, today's kids, today's school, today's education is not what once was. And I think that's a good thing. We have to reject the notion of this golden age. There wasn't one, y'all. Now, are there elements that we can take? Absolutely. Are there things that we need to learn from and grow from? Absolutely. But when I think about the things that were allowed to happen, even up until today, we have to be committed to rejecting the things that have harmed us. If there's any way that I could could say this plainly, it would be any narrative that mutes or denies our imperfection silences and refuses our humanity. Y'all know that has been the, the theme of this season, healing and humanity. We have to make education human again. But that starts with us making the little choices that we can make every single day and bring back that human approach to how we engage with others. When you make the classroom rules at the beginning of the year and you sit down with your class and you tell them about the rules that you've made, those are your rules. Those aren't class rules. How is the most valuable stakeholder in your room left out of the process of what makes this class successful? School leader, how is the most valuable asset in your school, your teachers, left out of the process of what it means to be a successful teacher? District leader, how are the most valuable asset, your principals, your school leaders, your deans, how are they left out of the process of what it means to be a successful school leader? Equity remains elusive because we are more concerned with looking right than being right. Let's be the the group that establishes, reestablishes humanity. We get involved in the messiness of equity. It's never going to be perfect, but it's worth every single effort we can make. Let's be willing to stand up in the face of injustice, in the face of wrongdoing, and call people in or call them out. Let's be willing to go beyond statements on the website to making a difference in people's lives daily. Because at the end of the day, maybe the problem isn't equity at all. Maybe the problem is us. Let's keep pushing.